Welcome to new listeners from the great state of Florida who might have heard Carol on the Saturday morning radio show, Better Lawns and Gardens with Teresa Watkins on WFLA Orlando, also on iHeartRadio and on demand via Apple Podcasts. Welcome to the Gardenangelist, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana, where I have a suburban garden measured in square feet. And I'm Dean Nash from Guthrie, Oklahoma, where I garden on several acres out in the country. We call ourselves Garden Angelists because we are evangelists for gardening. We love gardening and we want others to love it too. Yes, we do. And we aren't afraid to spill the beans and tell all of our gardening secrets, the good, the bad, and even the ugly. But that's enough of who, what, when, where. Let's move on to this week's episode. Hello, Carol. Hello, Dee. So how does your garden grow, Carol? Well, I got a half an inch of rain last night and it's still pretty wet out there. So right now I'd say it's growing pretty good. Good for you. What else is going on? So an X a day keeps the weeds at bay or at least a little bit more controlled. You know, I drew up that little calendar and every day that I go out and weed for about an hour, I make an X. I'm 19 days in as of yesterday and I have 19 X's. So I feel like it works for me to do that funny little thing. And I make a few notes about what I did. Plus Mm -hmm. this morning when I went out to check the rain gauge to see how much rain we had gotten, I spotted with my little eye, the first ripe figs. So I picked them. Good for you. I don't like figs. I like figs. And I picked some on both varieties, which is unusual for the one variety to ripen so soon. So I've got plans to write a blog post about how I grow my figs in Indiana because it's not, we're not big fig growing area, as you know. And uh, this will be a nice comparison to show the difference in the size of the fruit between the two varieties. It is striking. Hmm. More on that later. Interesting. I look forward to that post. And someone bought you gold stars. Yes, I got this package from Amazon. I thought I didn't order anything recently. And I opened it up and you had sent me gold stars for all my good gardening efforts, which I love. And they shall show up in various and sundry ways and pictures in the future. Some of them are big gold stars. Yeah, I thought that was fun. I thought that it had different, different sizes and that made it fun. It is fun. So what's going on in the garden in D's world? Yesterday, I went out and I weeded for a couple of hours and I also planted some plants I bought. Um, that were perennials, that are butterfly plants. But the big news is I bought plants to refresh my pots. Oh boy, did you? I saw the pictures you texted me from the garden place that you went to and I was so jealous. It was really fun. I had a good time. And so I, just so people know where I went, I went to TLC and I also went to the Big L and the Big L had quite a bit and so did TLC. TLC had unusual things which is kind of why I go there because it's a little pricier. Anyway, I bought peach celosia because I decided I'm going to let someone else grow it to maturity. Good idea. And I can just use it. And I bought some really pretty Rebecca Herta. There were some short variety for pots. Shine Skies Echinacea, some pretty ornamental peppers, two in the purple range and two others in the red and oranges. I also got a rug for my front door, which is so cute. And it has pumpkins and black and white checks, which goes with my black door, dark purple pansies and orange blotch pansies, which I've now decided I, I need to have another flat of orange blotch, but I'll do that later. And wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It is a rule that no matter how many pansies and violas you buy, you always want one more flat of them. Yeah. And they only had one flat of orange blotch at uh, TLC. And they were talking about how they were going to put it underneath, you know, the, Underneath the, I don't know what those are called, the benches. Tables, I guess. Baby benches. And I said, I'll no, I'll just take those because I thought they were really pretty with the dark purple. And then I was going to buy more Shine Spirit to put in, by my front pots. I didn't move those into pots because they're kind of in a little plastic decorative pot. And I couldn't find any in the white pots. So I bought a watering can, a little plastic watering can from the big A so I can water in the back of my house, you know, yep. in my bathroom where... And then I can leave my other watering can at the front of the house. It's a long house. And I bought some Dr. Earth plant food for my containers. And it's a little pump bottle. And you just pump it on top of the containers and water it in. 
which means you don't have to mix that smelly stuff. And I used it indoors and out. So now my house smells a little bit like fish emulsion. <laughs> I was going to say, you don't have to mix it. It does mm-hmm. still smell if it's organic. It usually does it have does. an odor. It stinks, but that's okay. That is wonderful. So we both had pretty good gardening weeks. We did. All right. Let's move on to the quote. September tries its best to have us forget summer. Bernard Williams. Yay, Bernard. You're absolutely right. And September still feels like summer in Oklahoma, but tomorrow we're supposed to get a cold front in or tonight. And it's supposed to drop us 20 degrees. And I'm ready because today is supposed to be 99, which is a little high for September. That is not a little high for September. That is very high for September. Not going to be that hot here. It's going to be in the 70s. Anyway, so our flower topic. I love it this week. It's my You you discovered it. Mm -hmm. And I actually had another friend text me this same article from the New York Times, Why You Should Do Your Spring Planting in the Fall by Margaret Roach. Mm -hmm. And she's referring to the Brooklyn Bridge Park and she does an interview And Margaret Roach is a good writer and she now writes for the New York Times, which I'm really glad because they needed a good garden writer. They hadn't had one in a while. So I'm excited. I'm excited about this. I've never been to this garden in Brooklyn. I had never even heard of it, but it's on a reclaimed shipping pier. I like that they're using those piers for other things, sort of like the one, the park we talked about in another part of New York city. And that's cool. So here's the thing that I thought was really good about this. And that's why I sent it to you. And I sent it to some other people too. They are trying what you, you actually explained it better on here. We're in your notes, but basically they are trying to not just do things according to what we've always been told. Right. Which all of those ideas came out of Europe and the United States has a very different climate from Europe. And so It makes more sense to do it this way. And I, I thought I've thought a lot about this article and I'm trying to do that. A lot of it. Right. Basically let go of control. And they talked about, you know, you think about some of those European gardens in the 18th and 19th century and all the topiary. And if you're going to keep a topiary shape, you're going to trim all the time. And so very much in control and the, big swaths of lawns in in Great Britain, bringing that to the United States, that is a style of gardening. And I would not, if someone says that's the way I want to garden, I'm like, knock yourselves out. But what's right. really fascinating about this Brooklyn Bridge Park is that they, they did it on a reclaimed shipping pier, like we said. Mm-hmm. And then they tried to think about nature and follow the cues from the migratory birds and the insects. And as a result, this place is a Bird, insect, biodiversity, I don't want to say heaven, but a very wild place to be. A very wild place to garden and a very wild place to go visit. And I would tell you, so what they, what this is actually called is ecological horticulture. And there's a quote from it. And it says, we encourage the dynamic between plants, wildlife, and soil, and strive to figure out how to get those plants to thrive independently of our care. We cultivate gardens with high levels of biodiversity and ecological functionality that can help repair the damage done to this land. And so what I took home from that was several things. But one of the biggest things is something a lot of people are already doing in their gardens more and more, which is if you have a balanced perennial garden, which is pretty much what mine is these days, with layers, because we're all trying to do layers so that the birds have somewhere to hide and all the different things, right? If you do this, then you leave that stuff in the fall and then you clean up in the spring. The difference is they don't clean it up and drag it away to a brush pile like I do, or a compost pile, they chop it up in little six inch segments and throw it back down on the soil as mulch. And that was just something that I thought about. And I thought about one other thing too, in connection with this, because I was out walking my garden last weekend. I mean, and Debbie came over for a little while and she said, your garden still looks really good in spite of everything, the heat and the late time of the year. And I looked around and I saw a ton of weeds in it. But then I laughed to myself because I thought if you grow plants that look like weeds, people don't see your weeds. 
That's kind of funny. Ha ha. <laughs> like goldenrod. My goldenrod is beautiful right now. And a lot of people might look and say, hey, you got weeds blooming. And another really pretty plant that blooms off and on through the year is fleabane. Yep. Fleabane those, does here too. And it's always very pretty. So yeah, the big takeaway is uh, garden cleanup in the fall, not so much a big deal. Clean it up in the spring, but I like the idea of leaving the trimmings in little chunks on the ground. The other thing that they talked a lot about was planting in the fall. Everybody's conditioned to plant everything in the spring and mm -hmm. fall planting for many, many trees, many, many shrubs, all kinds of perennials. They will actually settle in better and faster with less insect damage less need for you to water them all through the growing season if you plant them in the fall. Right. And I'm going to point out that in Oklahoma, you're still going to have to water in the summer because we basically have a drought summer, but not as much. And I don't water very much in the summer. I have drip irrigation and it's not on every plant. It's just in lines. So if a, if a plant needs a lot more water than another plant, I'll stick it nearer to the line, if that makes sense. So one of the reasons that they did this, and Carol kind of mentioned it, is that butterflies in the spring lay lots of little baby butterfly eggs. And then if you plant little tiny plants that are larval host plants, they eat them to nothing and they die. If you do it in the fall and they have all winter to grow, because as long as it's over 40 degrees ground temperature or even temperature here, um, your ground stays warmer. And so roots continue to grow. And then it'll really take off in the spring. So it has a lot more top growth for the butterflies to lay eggs on. And I thought about that and I thought that is really good advice. That is excellent advice. And they used to have these campaigns, fall is for planting. You know, the poor garden centers are sitting there with stock that is ready to be planted. But everybody's like, oh, we do that in the spring. You know, the traditional let's plant on Mother's Day. So we really want to encourage people to get out there and plant in the fall especially for perennials, trees, and shrubs. Of course, we are not suggesting you plant tropicals or annuals in the fall. No, not at all. So here's the thing that's kind of um, sort of a testament to the success at this garden, and we will link to the New York Times article, is they've spent, they have spotted 180 different species of birds, including an extremely rare painted bunting, which is kind of exciting. It's extremely exciting. And I noticed this year I have more butterflies than I've ever had. And that's because I've been transitioning the garden to an easier garden to care for with fewer, I would call them traditional plants. It's becoming more and more a prairie garden. But what's happened is it's become more and more full of life. Yes. And that's that's true here. I mean, I saw a Baltimore Oriole this summer twice. And so I feel like that was a testament to my gardening habits. And you don't have to have a big garden to do this either. Just like we talked about last week with Doug Tallamy, he's saying everybody should do some of this because that's the only way we're going to save the birds and insects. So let's go on to our next quote, because once again, I did not set the timer to go. So we have no idea how long this podcast episode is going to last, Dee. Yeah. And some of our, some of our people will be really happy about that. And others, I don't know, I guess they can come and listen later. And then the sun took a step back. The leaves lulled themselves to sleep and autumn was awakened. That's Raquel Franco. True enough. I'm telling you, I live about as far west as you can go in the eastern time zone. And mm -hmm. it is not daylight until almost, I mean, almost eight o'clock in the morning now. We, mm -hmm. we still are. And then even the days are getting shorter, obviously. But it's amazing how long it takes for morning to arrive right now. Yeah, I bet it is. Will it be better when we fall back or will it be worse there? It will be better in yeah. the morning, worse but evening morning. will come really early. So it's like, crazy. It's, yeah, I'm not excited about it. So we decided for our topic, there was something that we saw online that made us laugh. Yeah. And, um, yeah. <laughs> It was, it was, uh, we're going to link to it. It was a link on Modern Farmer and it was an at-home hydroponic indoor garden system. And um, hydroponics is when you grow plants without any soil. Um, so for people who are icked out by soil, they can just grow stuff with water and fertilizer. 
which kind of icks me out, but that's just me. So would it make sense to you? This is, we're asking you guys, would it make sense for you to spend up to a thousand dollars for lights on a hydroponic system to grow lettuce and other greens inside? Yeah. And what I would say is that's a thousand dollars that includes lights and the whole system, the irrigation. Um, and so people do this very legitimately and you, you kind of attach to a brand as far as I can tell. And yeah. then that brand, there's these uh, like seed pod things that you stick in and they say you can get lettuce to eat in about three weeks. That's so, quick. That is quick. <laughs> so here's the quote from the article. It says, with intelligent indoor gardening systems, you can now grow leafy greens, vegetables, herbs, and fruits in your living room, kitchen, even tiny studio apartment. So I think the key here is even tiny studio apartment. I think people who want to grow things who don't have a balcony or anything, and they just want to get their hands not dirty, they grow these. And I can understand why they do it because green living things are beautiful. That's why houseplants trend on social media all the time and why there's new houseplant books. So this reminds me of a funny story. And I don't know if I told this, but years ago, not far from here, this hydroponics store opened up. And so I thought, I'm just going to go check that out. So I went in and there was this very nice lady there and they had the hydroponic system and um, there were several back rooms and she insisted upon showing me everything that they were growing. They had tomatoes, they had lettuce. And I thought later, I think she thinks I'm a federal agent who's come to make sure they're not growing something illegal in there. Oh, that's funny. But she said now, she said that if you lived in certain areas, like in the inner cities of Indianapolis or near some industrial areas, your soil may contain heavy metals and it may not be healthy to grow fruit food in that soil. So she said she had a lot of customers who had outdoor hydroponic setups where they were growing stuff. And I thought that was kind of weird, but um, I didn't challenge her, but it was interesting, but there's, you can, you can easily spend a ton of money and then you spend a ton of money to have a fresh head of lettuce. Yeah, I'm not doing it. I think you could grow it in potting soil under lights for a whole lot cheaper if you wanted to do lettuce and you could get lettuce just almost as fast. But you know what? Knock yourselves out. If you want to do it, do it. But because I still I still say that microgreens is also something fun to grow inside in the wintertime that you can eat. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about a thousand dollar system and there are smaller systems that start around like $99 and then you got to buy all the seed pods and you're going to grow, you know, three, five heads of lettuce, small heads of lettuce under that one grow light. So if any of our listeners are doing this and want to tell us all about it, we are all ears. We are, we are. Or if someone wants to send us a system to trial, I'll give it a whirl, but I'm probably not going to buy one. I'm not either. I have lights already that I can grow stuff under if I want to. And and honestly, I need a break. I also have a greenhouse, so I, I know I'm spoiled, but I'm also 59. You should get what you want when you're 59. Exactly. But want to do our next quote? I'm doing the next quote. September. I never tire of turning it over and over in my mind. It has warmth, depth, and color. It glows like old amber by Patience Strong. And I want to point out, I used these quotes on my latest blog post at your suggestion, which was really nice. I found these and I still, let's just do all quotes on September because September is my favorite month in the garden. So on the bookshelf, we have high cactus, high cacti, not high cactus, high cacti. Um, I, I like this book a lot. It's bright yellow. It makes me smile. Yes. You know? It's by a lady. Her name is Sabina Palermo. And Sabina has a company. That's why she got the name. And it, the company is High Cacti. And it's about houseplants, especially the cactus, the ones in the succulent category. I like it. And I did not know what to expect when I got this book. She actually grew up in Texas and she has moved to England. And so her store is in 
I, th- I want to say Sussex, England, but don't quote me on that. Um, mm-hmm. But she has a chapter in here, and I think this is the, a good description of the book. Plant care is self-care. And so she's got 20 easy to grow house plants, plus some projects you can do, some drinks you can mix up with plant material, some recipes, some crafts, and then just some self-care. She has stuff on meditation. Um, so it is, it is not what I expected. I mean, it's not your typical houseplant book because it's sort of, if I was going to give it a, I'd say it's sort of like the houseplant style living. Yeah. In fact, I'm going to give it to my daughter, uh, Megan, after I'm done with it, because Megan loves cacti. I don't love cacti, but it isn't all about cacti either. In fact, I'm looking at pothos and um, I have several pothos. And I love how she, here she said, she's no devil. Don't worry. This plant's nickname, Devil's Ivy, isn't referencing bad voodoo or anything menacing. These shady plants grow wild in dark crevices of forest, hence being a friend to darkness. So they can handle very little light, which is why I love them. And um, she has peace lilies. I'll forgive her for that. And she has Hartley philodendrons, which we've talked about many times, sometimes at Valentine's Day. There's, there's all kinds of things in here. Aglonemas, which we know I love. Um, I I really like it. It's sweet. It's written, in my opinion, it's written to people in their 20s and 30s. It's got a lot of great information in a very friendly way. And I I think I'm going to give it to my nephew's wife. She is very much into houseplants. And anybody can get my nephew to spend an afternoon at a houseplant store. That's that's love, that's, right? <laughs> right. That's true love, especially if you're not into houseplants. So it has the ZZ plant, which my daughter, I gave her one. And so I think she'll just really, I think Megan will like this. Yes. I think it's good. It's sort of a houseplant lifestyle book. It is. That's exactly that, what it is. That is high cacti. And let us say it's not all about cactus. That's just the name of her store. Right. High right. cacti, Growing Houseplants and Happiness by Sabina Palermo. It make a good Christmas present for someone. That's right. Combine it with a plant. As we always say, a book and a plant, what could be a better gift? Exactly. And you could get them some of those little tools, the little, the little house plant tools just for fun. Oh, I've got some of those. Don't you have some of those? I don't, I don't have any of them, but I think they're cute. I have all kinds of tools. All right. Your turn to do the quote. Ah, September, you are the doorway to the season that awakens my soul. Peggy, Tony, Horton. That quote is you, D. It is. It is. Well, my birthday's in September for one thing, but I I like the change in the light. I think pictures are easier to take in September. Butterflies. I mean, really, what is not to like other than it's been a little too hot, but it's going to cool off people. Okay, so this is creepy dirt. Everybody hold on to their chairs or their or their it's not that creepy. It's kind of creepy, I think. That's that bug is bad. Yes. So there's a uh, a boy in Kansas who entered a insect display at the state fair and got a lot more attention than he ever dreamed because his collection included the spotted lanternfly that we talked about a few episodes ago. That is one bad imported bug. And no one thought it had really gone east or west of Ohio. And they found it in Indiana. And now he found one in Kansas. So it is high alert time. It is because it's scary. Um, It's a very scary bug. It eats a lot of things. And um, it's a very attractive bug. You guys, we're going to link to the article, but look up the spotted lanternfly. If you see it, immediately kill it and then um, notify your, I don't know what, the entomology department. In I your- would notify, um, you could notify your cooperative extension service, um, Department of Natural <laughs> Resources, anybody that will answer the phone. If you think you have a spotted lanternfly, they will be right there to figure out. And I was reading more about the area that they found in Indiana, and they've been selectively treating certain of the, um, I'll call them host plants, that they're most likely found in this one area. And they think they've been there for a while. So, Ooh. Well, they're bad. And um, if you 
you, you need to know what it looks like. The actual adult um, is very distinct and very pretty, um, but it's a bad, it's a bad bug. And then the larval stage, um, identify that too, you know, have that ready just in case, because, you know, Japanese beetles are in Oklahoma. So the good news about the one that was found in Kansas, um, the boy had found it the year before and it was, I mean, it was desiccated. So it's not like he had just killed it and found it. So he, it may have just come in on somebody's car and yeah. not actually spread to Kansas. They're, they're very uh, good hitchhikers, which yeah. is how they end up. They'll like attach to the grill of a car and then, you know, cross the state line from Pennsylvania to Ohio to Indiana to Kansas, so, apparently. There you go. We also have some more, more dirt, and it's about the Netherlands. Well, and I just read a few things where they're saying that with the weather, some weather issues in the Netherlands and then shipping issues everywhere. Some of the bulbs that are come in from the Netherlands to the United States, some of the shipping has been delayed. And so it's causing a bit of angst with some of the bulb suppliers, but I think they're working through it. And so we're just asking people to be patient. If your bulbs don't arrive just the minute you want to plant them, remember there's a big time frame in the fall when you can get bulbs planted. So if they're a few weeks later than normal, nobody panic. Yeah, you can wait and plant them here all the way into December. Um, I don't I mean there. It depends on whether your ground freezes or not, right? We're good through Thanksgiving, I think, at least. And I always tell people don't plant bulbs until Thanksgiving because you don't want them growing here. And our our falls and our winters have been particularly strange in Oklahoma for the last few years. So there you go. Now, Carol has rabbit holes. So you want to do your rabbit hole or you want me to do my rabbit hole first? Mine's well, deep. I got it. Okay. Hers is deep. Mine's not so deep. I would say I'm still in the butterfly rabbit hole. I have so many butterflies in my garden this year that I spend a lot of time. Uh, I go on Facebook to the butterflies of Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, where we report things we see. And so it's really helpful to entomologists in the state. And I've been doing that, but I also bought a butterfly ID book, a better one, one of the best ones on the market. And um, it's supposed to be here today. And I also bought a fruit feeder because I get all the butterflies that go to nectar plants, but I want some that go to fruit. So that's my, that's mine. And we can link to those. I'll put up links to the butterfly guide and the feeder on our notes. So D, why do our rabbit holes always lead to book purchases? Because we like books a lot. Yeah. So I, I sent out my newsletter last week and I always say, a little section on what I'm reading and did anybody have any suggestions? And so one of my readers in England says, Hey, have you read books by Dave Goulson? And I had never heard of him, but it turns out he's a biology professor at Sussex university who loves insects. And he has written six or seven, probably books on insects. So I have three of them on hold at the library. Uh, one of them is silent earth averting the insect apocalypse which is coming out September 28th. And I'm the first one to get the one copy that the library is going to have <laughs> um, a sting in the tail, my adventures with bu bumblebees and a buzz in the meadow, the natural history of a French farm. And that was in transit to my library branch. So then of course I did go to bookshop.org and Amazon and some of the other books are out of print or uh, you can't really get new copies. So I might've gotten a, Another couple of books. We won't talk about that. <laughs> um, so one of the things he's pointing out is that 87% of all plants need an insect of some type to pollinate them, including coffee and chocolate. <laughs> exactly. The chocolate's what got me. Yeah, I love coffee and I love chocolate. So I definitely want insects to survive. I also like almonds and the almond orchards need insects. They are completely dependent upon honeybees actually to pollinate them because we don't have enough native bees to do it anymore. That's why they truck them over to California. They right. are changing. I'm going to just quickly, they are changing in California in several of those um, almond orchards and they're creating meadows under the trees instead of just bare earth because bare earth was considered easier and all that stuff. They've realized now that of course you don't have enough insects if you have bare earth. And on top of that, you don't have any insulation for your trees. 
So your roots get hot. Right. So, you know, we are changing slowly and that's a good thing. And so I, um, down in the rabbit hole, I found a Ted talk that he did in 2019, where he talked about the disappearance of insects. And this is something that's been studied extensively and sort of first identified by amateurs in Germany. Mm -hmm. But he says that two things have led to the disappearance of insects, at least in England. This guy's from the England. It's true everywhere. You know, it is the reduction of biodiversity. So they cut down all their hedgerows. And so that was bad. And then heavy use of pesticides, even in the home garden. But in the Ted talk, he talks about like you've done is you're choosing plants now that are better for pollinators. And so he showed, uh, I would call it a hybrid tea rose next to a more species type rose. And you can see how open the rose is with the anthers and the pollen and the nectar all exposed for the insects, the, the bees Ew, and the, the ha- hybrid one where it's like, nobody's going to pollen, no insects going to pollinate that. But anyway, I, I almost think that maybe he's the, the Doug Tallamy of Great Britain or um, Doug Tallamy be. is the D- Dave Goulson of the United States. I, I think. So, well, you know, what I'm the rabbit hole. I'll let you know. I'm going to go watch that Ted talk. Um, are we going to talk about the shepherd next time? The one that I saw on CBS Saturday morning. Yes. Which yeah. Talks about the same that's thing. That's a teaser. So that's, that's a, a teaser. teaser. That's a teaser. Even shepherds are thinking about this stuff. Yes. Okay. So you've got a bunch of books. I've got yep. a book coming to help me identify butterflies better because some butterflies look just alike. But some opinion. of my books are coming from the library. It's not like I bought all of them yet. I, and I can't have a library um, membership because I live out in the country. It's a long story. All right. So garden commissions. Um, I am going to keep. So I, what I, one of the things I did was I, um, I cleared out part of the potage and you were right. The strawberries used up all the nutrients in this one section. So then I went and got a bunch of my shredded leaves out of the pile. And then I just piled up shredded leaves three inches thick on the two beds I've cleaned out. I've got to clean out the other two. So that's one thing I'm going to do. And I'm also going to start pulling down my tomatoes because they're not producing that well anymore because, you know, it's the lights getting less and stuff. And I'll pull off all the tomatoes, the green ones too. And then you can either ripen those or you can fry them, either one or both. And then I'm going to do that and I'm going to empty some of that potting soil into other places where my soil has gone way, way down. So there you go. I'm going to keep up with my X's on my calendar. An hour of weeding a day keeps the weeds at bay. I'm also starting to tear out stuff in the vegetable garden. So I'm going to confess that I grew okra, but I never ate the okra. Cucumber vines are kaput. Uh, The sweet corn is all dried out. It's got the beans running through it, but the beans that I planted, they were not very good. And I'm thinking these aren't even worth harvesting. So I got to tear all that out. It's a bit of a mess. Wait, wait, uh, wait, wait. I thought you grew green beans you really liked this year. So you grew one packet of yuckies. Well, the bush beans that I grew provider, I love. They are fabulous. This is a pole bean that I planted in the corn to grow up the corn right. and it successfully grew up the corn, but most pole beans, they are so stringy. I don't find me a stringless pole bean and I'll be happy. So oh, I messed with them for a little bit and I thought these aren't even worth eating. So, yeah. And I have to confess, I didn't eat my okra either. Remember I grew that one. Yes. It, it's terrible. It just becomes pithy and gross really quick. I think it was candle fire. Do you remember which okra you grew? No. Just, okay. It doesn't matter. I didn't, I didn't not eat it because it was bad tasting. I didn't eat it because I am inherently lazy. <laughs> and with that, we want to thank you for listening to the Garden Angelist. If you like our podcast, please tell your friends about us. Also hit that subscribe button so you don't miss anything. I mean, why would you want to miss anything? And if you listen to Apple Podcasts, we'd love a five-star review. It helps us get noticed by others. Could you also share your podcast with your gardening friends? Word of mouth is still the best way to get the word out there. Yes, and be sure and check out show notes for links for more information about today's topics, plus links to our own websites. And if you want to help support us, you can use one of those affiliate links. If you buy something after clicking through on them, we're in a small commission and it costs you nothing. It was lovely to chat with all of you over the garden gate today. Bye until next week.
Bye, everybody. Bye.